Hello and welcome to another edition of As the Blade Turns. For those of you who are new here, my name is Dave Lees. I had initially planned this as a one-year retrospective of the Camila Valjeva doping situation and a reflection on the women's figure skating final. And then yesterday, news broke that was extremely relevant to this story. I'm going to provide a news update in the case and then break down my analysis of the situation and where figure skating and Olympic or sport remain a year later. On Tuesday, the World Anti-Doping Agency announced that it will appeal the Russian Anti-Doping Agency's wrong decision on figure skater Kamila Valjeva to the Court of Arbitration for Sport, seeking a four-year ban for Valjeva and disqualification of all of her results since late December 2021, including those from the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics and the 2022 European Championships. WADA said in its announcement that it will continue to push for this matter to proceed without further undue delay. In January, a Rusada disciplinary tribunal found that while the then 15-year-old Valjeva committed an anti-doping rule violation, she bore no fault or negligence for it. Rusada imposed no sanction except for the disqualification of her results on the date the sample was collected, which was December 25th, 2021, at the Russian National Championships. Today, the International Skating Union followed suit with an appeal of its own. In its announcement, WADA said the finding by the Rusada Disciplinary Tribunal was wrong under the terms of the World Anti-Doping Code in this case. Within the appeal, WADA is seeking a four-year period of ineligibility and disqualification of all of the athletes' results from the date of the sample collection on December 25, 2021. If CAS rules in favor of Valjeva, that would most likely be the end of the case, and the medals would eventually be awarded in the current order of Russia, USA, and Japan for the figure skating team event. There has been a lot of talk of awarding those medals at the 2024 Paris Summer Olympics, although Russia's invasion of Ukraine and now year-long war certainly would complicate any plans to highlight such a high-profile Russian gold medal. If CAS rules against Valjeva, then the International Skating Union, the Worldwide Federation for Figure Skating, and the International Olympic Committee would begin their work. As IOC spokesman Mark Adams had told USA Today earlier this month, only the finalization of the case will enable the International Skating Union to establish the definitive results of the figure skating team competition at these 2022 games and the IOC to decide on the medal allocation. Another CAS panel that convened via emergency at the Beijing Olympics allowed Valjeva to continue to compete in the women's competition at the Games, citing the fact that Valjeva was a protected person, a minor in this case, under water rules. That CAS ruling did not address the merits of the doping case, and in fact allowed her to compete in part because of the possibility that she might not be banned at a later date. The ISU also filed an appeal with the CAS against the decision of the Disciplinary Anti-Doping Committee of Rusada. ISU received a copy of the reasoned decision in both Russian and English on January 26th and a full copy of the case file on February 2nd. The ISU conducted a full review of Rusada's decision and case materials and decided to appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. The ISU believes that young athletes should be protected from doping. Such protection cannot be provided by exempting young athletes from punishment. As part of the appeal, the ISU is seeking Valjeva's disqualification, effective December 25, 2021, for a period at the discretion of CAS, as well as the annulment of all results achieved during this period, including the forfeiture of all medals, points, and prizes. In addition, CAS must decide on the consequences of the anti-doping rule violation committed by Valjeva and determine the final results of the team tournament at the Beijing 2022 Olympic Games. In the interests of all skaters and all stakeholders, 
the ISU will continue to insist that this case be dealt with without further undue delay. Given that the case is under review by the CIS, the ISU is unable to comment further at this time, said the ISU in a statement. The International Olympic Committee commented on WADA's appeal with CAS. The IOC welcomes WADA's decision to refer the case to CAS, which brings us one step closer to completing the process that athletes have been waiting for. Since this case concerns a non-Olympic sample that affected the results of the team and individual figure skating tournaments at the Beijing Olympics, the IOC hopes that the case will be resolved as quickly as possible. It is also in the interest of all involved, especially the athletes who are still unable to receive medals from the Beijing 2022 Games. Only the end of this case will allow the ISU to determine the final results of the Olympic team tournament and the IOC to decide on the distribution of medals. As expected, the Russian Gaslighting Committee was quick to weigh in. They had to file somewhere probably to express their opinion. I don't even know what else to say. We have Lukernik at ISU. You have to ask him what he thinks about this. I can't help Camila in this situation, said noted coach of the USSR, Tatiana Anatolevna Tarasova. It was clear that WADA would appeal to CAS. Of course, demanding four years of disqualification is unfair. Now everything they do is unfair said Olympic silver medalist and noted coach, Alexander Zhulin. Then, Russian sports lawyer Anna Ansilievich was interviewed a number of times. The consideration of the WADA appeal may be delayed, but the question here is whether the parties will now agree on an expedited consideration. If they agree, then CAS will consider in the schedule in which the parties agreed which could be a week or a month, roughly speaking. If they do not agree, then there are prescribed deadlines, but usually at the request of the parties, they can be extended if there are legal grounds. Officially, yes, this case may drag on, especially if one of the parties says that they need to conduct some kind of scientific examination. WADA's appeal to CAS means that they have reviewed the documents and felt that there are no grounds for reducing sanctions. There is a division, complete fault of the athlete, minor fault, or no fault. The Disciplinary Anti-Doping Committee has ruled no fault, and what WADA is asking for is total fault. It is possible to avoid disqualification for four years. This is a competitive process, and the question here is to what extent the parties will be able to prove their position. But one must understand that not only Rusada and the athlete, but also WADA will prove their position. The question now is whether the parties will agree on an expedited review. If agreed, the decision will be made very quickly. Within a week or months, if they do not agree, well, it will be much delayed. That is, it should be known that within a few months, we will know the result. Depending on what decision will be made, the distribution of the medals will also be determined. If CAS still grants the appeal and finds Camila guilty, an appeal can be filed with the Swiss Supreme Court on procedural issues. In essence, the Supreme Court of Switzerland does not consider the case, but only if procedural rights of one of the parties are violated. Then they have the right to appeal to the Swiss Supreme Court. For example, the case of Claudia Pechstein, the famous speed skater. She proved that her rights were violated at open hearings. The Swiss Supreme Court overturned the CAS decision. Sun Yang, a Chinese swimmer, had this, Ansilievich said. I just wanted to make a note here that it's very interesting that Anna Ansilievich is actually saying this because for so long, the Russians have already been talking about the fact that Kamila Volyeva was 15 years old and a protected person. Should the CAS rule in favor of WADA, I think it is quite plausible that you would find the Rusada uh, to appeal the Swiss Supreme Court on procedural grounds that Camila Valgeva's right to anonymity was violated in this case, um, which is something that they have been hinting at uh, throughout the last year. 
Now, noted Russian commentator Yolanda Chen, who herself is a former track and field star, weighed in. Let's be honest, there is no fault of the athlete herself because the young athlete of the Russian national team should be monitored by coaches, doctors, and a huge number of people who receive a salary. They should know about the condition of the skater, what she uses and applies. In the strictest way in modern sports, this should be adjusted. If there are specially trained people who receive decent money, they should do their job. I don't want to offend anyone, but there are guilty people in Valjeva's entourage. The drug that was found was taken. It's the fault of the people who were supposed to watch this, and they provoked this whole situation. For us, this should be a good lesson, not only in figure skating. Work with athletes on the part of medical preparations should be organized everywhere. Otherwise, it may leave a big mark on Russian sports. Secondly, we understand that it is a biased business. It is already clear. The point is not in drugs, but in political pressure. How to treat it? Just like everything else that's happening right now. We are discussing our possible participation in the international arena and the hope for the restoration of Russian sports. I think that there are all links in the same chain. Unfortunately, we will pass these tests. We are hardy people and we will definitely get through everything. Now our sports lawyers need to take the issue of Camila seriously and file counterclaims and appeals. Find out why, after a year, the topic is raised again. You can't retreat. We must fight. You cannot go on about and agree with the situation. But let's not forget, there is a share of our fault here. We must understand that this issue must be taken extremely seriously. Now, I do find it interesting that Yolanda Chen brings up that it's taking a full year and it's being brought up again. The only reason <laughs> that it has taken a year for it to come up again is because Rusada has delayed their ruling, which was originally supposed to be determined by August until January and then the end of January, which didn't get fully to the ISU until the beginning of February. So as we can see, it's actually Russia's fault that this is only being brought up again a year later. Now, three-time Olympic champion, member of the Russian Duma, and self-important bitch, Arena Rodnina, weighed in. I think that WADA had reason to contact CAS. Camila's case is Rusada's trouble. These are not far-fetched accusations. The fact of illegal drugs was what it was. I'm not familiar with allowable doses, but the rules were broken. Yes, it's too late to check the samples, but the fact remains. This cannot be called political pressure. This is our problem. Rusada made a mistake by working inefficiently before the Olympics, said Rodina. This is interesting that she said that Rusada was working inefficiently. Remember, Rusada took the sample, but they couldn't actually administer the test because Rusada is currently banned by WADA. The Rusada lab is not allowed to do drug tests because they've proven themselves to be untrustworthy time and time again, even deleting uh, records as part of their years-long penance, which has been going on since 2016, which dates back to before the Sochi Olympics. Now, if she is saying Rusada made a mistake by working inefficiently, you have to wonder, does she mean that Rusada should have found Valieva's sample as tested positive and banned her, or as to find her sample to make sure that it would test clean? You know, all of this reminded me of fantastic comments from Rodnina in a 1991 article by Phil Hirsch when Russian ice dancer Marina Klimova, mother of American ice dancer Anthony Ponomarenko, also tested positive for doping, only to eventually have her B sample be miraculously clean. Mind you, the A sample and B sample are taken by pouring the same urine collection into two separate containers. In 1991, at the European Championships, the ISU confirmed the analysis of Klimova's A sample by a lab in Sofia and that it revealed an elevated testosterone to epitestosterone ratio, 
which suggests the addition of testosterone not naturally produced by the body. The result must be confirmed by analysis of the B sample. It will be done at the lab in Cologne, Germany, which is accredited by the International Olympic Committee. The SOFIA lab is, was not accredited. If the B sample is also positive, Klimova and partner Sergei Ponomarenko, the reigning world champions, would be suspended for two years. It would have knocked them out of the upcoming 1991 World Championships and the 1992 Olympic Games, which they eventually won. This is where Ronina weighs in. For me, this is no surprise, said Ronina, winner of three Olympic gold medals and 10 World Championships from 1969 to 1980. I was with the national team for many years and I know what goes on, but I don't understand a dancer doing this. Boys in pairs and singles use drugs. But this was only in August or September. This was done just in training, and everyone was tested before competitions. Questions about accuracy of the Bulgarian lab that did the test and possible sabotage are being raised because it is so rare for figure skaters to be found guilty of drug use. The sport's only other doping case involved a French junior ice dancer found positive for a weight loss drug in 1982. Rodina spoke after watching the Paris competition at the U.S. Figure Skating Championships in Minneapolis. And she said she knew of the use of performance-enhancing drugs in figure skating dating back to the early 1970s. Now, it's interesting that she talks about boys in pairs and singles using drugs during her time because she was a pair skater during her time who skated with a boy and certainly would have benefited if her partner used performance-enhancing drugs. But I like the um, intimation that it was only done in August or September. It's actually interesting because if you talk uh, to some former Soviet athletes from that time, they will talk about blood actually being removed during August or September and then being re-injected back into the body prior to competitions. Um, that form of blood doping even being done back in the 1970s. It's interesting that she does say that they would, everyone was tested before competitions. And it seems that they're not being tested to exclude them from competition. They're being tested to make sure that whatever they took is testing clean. But in Arena's, Rodina's logic, this seems positively fine and normal. And she actually seems to be the only person <laughs> speaking authentically in this situation. Although what she says is anti-ethical to the fair world <laughs> anti-doping code. Now, Travis Tigert head of the United States Anti-Doping Agency weighed in with a more expected response. This should have been done to restore confidence in the global anti-doping system, and we are very grateful. Now let's hope the hearings go quickly and are open to the public so that the athletes whose dreams hang in the balance can have confidence in the final result, whatever it may be, and that justice can be restored soon. A year ago, the sport of figure skating suffered an attack of a generation. And I wanted to put things in context because immediately prior to the Beijing Olympics, we were all watching the documentary Meddling about the 2002 Winter Olympics on Peacock. And I just wanted to give a little bit of context for this and how long that situation took to resolve. On February 11th, 2002, marie Rene Lagoon broke down in a hotel lobby in Salt Lake City and admitted to voting for the Russian pair over the Canadians in the final. The event, which was held on U.S. soil, was ideal for the breeding ground of the North American mass media. And while President Otavio Cinquanta initially stonewalled the media, the International Olympic Committee was so embarrassed by the coverage that they forced the hand of the ISU to resolve the matter and made a decision to award a second set of gold medals to Sally Ann Peltier just four days later. Four days. The second medal ceremony took place two days after the announcement, meaning the majority of the scandal resolved in under a week. In the aftermath, the ISU overhauled its judging system and originally moved to anonymous judging, which they have since gotten rid of. The ISU investigated Marie René and French President Didier Gaillaghe, issuing temporary suspensions to both. And while the accusation had always been that the French judge voted in favor of the Russian pair in exchange for support 
for the French dance team in the ice dance event, who did eventually win, the Russian side of the purported deal was never formally investigated and no suspensions were ever issued against anyone from the Russian Figure Skating Federation. I also wanted to provide some precedents for doping in both figure skating and gymnastics to provide context. It's ironic that Elena Berezhnaya, the female Russian skater involved in Skategate in 2002, as it was known, had actually been stripped of a gold medal at the 2000 European Championships and barred from competing at the 2000 World Championships because she tested positive for Sudafed. It is the same substance that 17-year-old Romanian gymnast Andrea Radican would test positive for seven months later at the 2000 Olympic Games in Sydney. In both cases, the athletes were stripped of their medals. Both athletes mentioned suffering from colds, and the world, though empathetic about their cases of the simples, chalk the situation up to making a bad judgment about taking a banned cold pill. Now, Andrea Radican is regarded as somewhat of a martyr in gymnastic circles, and the entire 2000 Olympics is considered to be a gigantic mess. Radican has remained a celebrity in Romania. And while her doctor admits fault for it, he also admits that he gave every member of that team Sudafed leading up to the games. Radican actually had a documentary following her quest to overturn the decision, but the IOC, the FIG, and the Court of Arbitration for Sport have not budged from their position regarding her disqualification. And it's interesting because in 2022, Camila Valjeva would test positive for the banned substance of trimetazidine, a medicine for congestive heart failure, which is used as a hormone and metabolic modulator in sports requiring endurance. It's not used for a case of the sniffles. Valjeva actually tested positive for three heart medications, which is actually far more damning and really calls into question any of this uh, notion that she somehow ingested her grandfather's heart medication by accident, even though he was thousands of miles away. She was taking trimetazidine, L-carnitine, and hypoxin. And though L-carnitine and hypoxin are not actually banned, it points to the fact that she was taking some sort of of a heart medication cocktail for performance enhancing benefits, which really calls into question how and why she is taking these three drugs, how high up these practices go, how widespread these practices go, especially when the doctor who administered these drugs to her is seen at the boards at the Olympics and the boards of every single Russian figure skating competition. Now, the Russians and their defenders have continually harped on the fact that Valjeva is only 15 years old, and what 15-year-old girl would knowingly take a banned substance. That innocence defense did not work for Andrea Radican, but she was 17, not 15. Although I have to ask, what's the difference? If you are old enough to earn a gold medal at the Olympic Games, are you not old enough to be expected to play by the rules? Now, Given that she is 15, she is considered to be a protected person under the World Anti-Doping Code, so she's not really considered to be at fault. Therefore, her punishment should be less. But it really is ironic that an athlete can be considered old enough to win a gold medal and receive all of the spoils of victory in the biggest sporting event in the world, yet not old enough to be considered responsible for following its rules. Now, it should be noted that Valieva tested positive for trimetazidine prior to the games in Beijing, never sh meaning she never should have been allowed to go. And many point to the fact that Elizaveta Tukdemisheva would have been able to go to the Olympics. Tukdemisheva was actually um, thought to be undermarked at the Russian figure skating championships in favor of Anna Sherbakova, who eventually won. Now, this is interesting because Tuktimisheva has also emerged as a martyr, but Tuktimisheva admitted to taking meldonium, which many Russian figure skaters took well after the period that it was banned by WADA. Now, Tuktimisheva took it the season before it was banned by WADA, but many Russians actually tested positive for it after. And we actually don't know how many figure skaters took positive, uh, tested positive for it after the fact, or sorry, took it after the fact, we only know that Ekaterina Bobrova tested positive. Dr. Shevetsky, the same doctor 
that Volyeva had administered meldonium to her. Now, Shikari Richardson, the American sprinter who was not allowed to compete at the Tokyo Olympics maybe half a year prior to the Valieva situation, had tested positive for marijuana, a drug that is generally not thought to be performance enhancing for sprinting. Now, she reportedly consumed marijuana after learning of the passing of her mother during a live interview from a journalist, which is a huge trauma, but she was not given any special empathetic exemption by the sports governing bodies. According to Richardson, the only difference she sees is that she's a black young lady. She wanted to know if she could get a solid answer on the difference between her situation and Valieva's. My mother died and I can't run and was also favored to place top three. Now, Valieva tested positive for the banned drug trimetazidine, a medicine usually used to treat angina attacks but it is known to improve endurance in athletes. Jessica Callang was also held out of competition for a chemical that was eventually found to be from her eyelash glue. Now she was actually held out by USADA, her own country's anti-doping agency, which had the same responsibility as Rusada in Valjeva's situation. Now in the wake of Valjeva and the ban on Russian athletes, the sport has faced dwindling ratings nowhere more evident than the ISU's YouTube channel. While some point to typical four-year cycles and retirements of specific athletes, it is a far bigger dent than usual. And when I spoke to one television analyst, they mentioned that the world had witnessed child abuse in real time and that there was no going back from it. And that while it had been discussed and suggested for many years, it was now witnessed in real time by a global audience and was then cemented by the war in Ukraine by the same country. And it wasn't just Valjeva that we saw, which had echoes of child abuse, but Sasha Truseva, who appeared to have a meltdown in real time and was less than comforted by the adults around her. Sasha Truseva has never been the same athlete since. The Russian figure skating media has actually ridiculed Sasha Truseva extensively over the last year and covered her in dramatic fashion. We have not seen her exhibit any interest in sport. And while some are accusing her of being too interested in fame and her boyfriend, the athlete posted a heartbreaking post on Instagram last week that really questions whether or not she is over anything that happened a year ago. Trusova wrote, a year ago, I reached my goal. I completed five quad jumps in one program and I set 11 Olympic records. But unfortunately, my dream did not come true that day. I sincerely wish that your dreams come true. Anna Sherbakova won the gold medal and has quietly exited from competitive sport almost as quietly as she reacted to winning the gold in stunned silence. Her lack of celebration stunned and concerned viewers around the world. Now, Camila Volyeva has lived as a martyr in Russia and been featured on 30-foot billboards and banners. She initially gained notoriety this fall by performing a program that cast the entire situation as a political media conspiracy by the West. In recent months, she has worked to restore her jumps and stave off Sofia Akacheva, who beat her at Russian Nationals, and Adelia Petrosian, who is also close to passing her by. Valieva did go viral around the world for her exhibition performance as Wednesday Adams at this year's Russian Nationals, showing how inconsequential this matter is to those from a global audience whose attention spans barely remember what occurred in Beijing with this particular skater in a different context, which also speaks to the reduced impact that figure skating has around the globe. Now, it is also telling that the case file remains sealed. Rusada has demanded privacy and secrecy for its 15-year-old skater, but essentially, they are not being held accountable for why it took almost 12 months for them to reach a conclusion that they could have reached in a matter of days. Has anyone actually been held accountable? Initially, Dr. Shevetsky 
appeared to have left Hrustalni, the training center for Terry Tudbaritsa's doctor. But it is important to remember that he was hired by the Russian Figure Skating Federation and reports to the Federal Biomedical Agency. He has not lost his job with the FMBA. He may still be directing pharmacological preparations for skaters at Rustalny and for the Federation at large. While he originally was less visible this season, he was by the boards at the recent Channel One Cup. He was last seen in the team box at the team event, the team event that remains in question. One could argue he was a very important member of the team. Now, Ateri Tuberiza has not been held accountable in the press, and certainly not by name. Members of the Russian Gaslighting Committee will only go as far as to question Valieva's entourage, but they never point figures. The Russians have essentially boiled the question down to whether a 15-year-old can be held responsible for taking drugs, instead of displaying any concern or questioning for how or why a 15-year-old ingested trimetazidine in the first place. Essentially, the entire sport has stood still for the last year in some sort of bizarre Groundhog Day. Figure skating was essentially handed over to the Russians prior to the Sochi Olympics by awarding them top marks despite any errors in technique or lack of program components and overlooking and even celebrating the practices of Ateri Tudbaridze. They made their female athletes suck up all of the oxygen at every competition and use them for ratings and for views around the internet and then ban them, leaving athletes who felt like also rans to somehow be expected to compete and view themselves as champions. They also expected the general public to do the same, but the general public became accustomed to watching athletes perform quad after quad, and there is a feeling that the skating is somehow less impressive, less competitive, or less exciting. And after watching the athletes push the technical limits for years, watching a skater struggle to execute a clean triple-triple combination is less thrilling for some, even if we know deep down that a triple-triple or triple-axle may be the physical limit for an athlete not taking trimetazidine. It also leaves a sour taste in the mouth of a viewer who has to wonder just how many figure skating results should be invalidated. And for those of you who will comment that you like the current skaters just fine, you do deserve to be validated, but you are also not the viewer who turned off the sport this season. There are others who remain disgusted by the war and by the ISU and IOC's inability to resolve the situation. And those viewers also deserve to be validated, especially as Thomas Bach continues to push for Russians to return as neutral athletes, even though the war is only set to increase in the spring months. Essentially, we have waited 13 months for every organization to formally file a position we already knew they had a year ago. And no matter what the outcome in this situation is, it certainly looks like there will inevitably be an appeal, which will only alienate fed-up viewers even further. On tomorrow's edition of As the Blade Turns, I will look at the status of Russian neutrality, the rise of Dr. Shevetsky, what Dr. Shevetsky, Tatiana Voloshizhar, and Lu Chen were discussing with regards to xenon gas in China, and how the ISU has used Valieva's case to raise the age limit for skaters to compete at the senior level. Yet age controversies and age limits are something the IOC and ISU have been even more wishy-washy on dealing with than doping. Note that the ISU, in their appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport, is leaving it up to the CAS to determine how long Valieva's ban should be. The ISU did not demand a four-year ban for Valieva like WADA did. So is the ISU really holding Valieva and the Russians accountable? Or are they essentially filing a piece of paper to make it look like they are holding Valieva and the Russians accountable while actually 
just forfeiting their position and letting the CIS determine it, while also avoiding enmity from the Russians. Good night.